Good evening, everyone. Is, is this microphone working, by the way? Okay, great. Um, I'm Alfredo Santfilio. I'll be chairing this um, session uh, today. Um, and I'm very, very um, happy and honored to have Professor Oslem Onaram from the University of Greenwich um, to uh, give us the uh, Development Studies um, Seminar this evening. Uh, but before we start with the, with the seminar, there's uh, um, a piece of information from the Students' Union. So we'll have exactly 23 seconds for the SU. Hi everyone, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, uh, I'm Hamish, I'm Academic Affairs Officer with the Students' Union this year. Uh, I've just sort of come to make everyone aware about uh, one of the things we're doing at the minute and one of the uh, parts of staff uh, student kind of mobilization that's happening right now around opposition to uh, this decision that's being made about student hubs. What they want to do in a, in a nutshell is basically take away your departmental academic support and replace it with a series of hubs. So in essence, if you have a problem uh, academically with your degree, you wouldn't go to your department anymore. You would go to a hub and you'd be completely withdrawn from your department in terms of the, the connect there. Uh, what we're doing about this is we have a petition at the minute that's going around. Uh, we'd really appreciate if everyone could sign that. It's been going around on student lists and also on Facebook and Twitter. There's also a staff student walkout on Friday at 1 p.m. And we really, really, really would appreciate if as many people could join that as possible. It's going to be a massive show of solidarity for the members of uh, your sort of administrative staff whose necks are really on the line here. And also just to show to the school that uh, we, we oppose this uh, hub system and we really want actually departmental academic support from our departments and not from a student hub. So yeah, uh, any questions you can email academic at sars.ac.uk. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, now Professor Oslem Onoran uh, teaches at the University of Greenwich uh, and she's also director of the Greenwich uh, political Economy Research uh, Center. Oslem has done an enormous amount of research on inequality, on wage-led growth, on employment, globalization, gender, and economic uh, crises. She has also directed research projects for uh, the uh, International Labour Organization, for UNCTAD, for the Institute for New Economic Thinking, for the Foundation for uh, uh, European Progressive uh, Studies, the Vienna Chamber of Labor, the Austrian Science Foundation, and Unions 21. Uh, she's a member of the Scientific Committee of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Hans Bockler Foundation, and the Policy uh, Advisory Group of the Women's Budget Group. Uh, Oslem is a member of the Coordinating Committee of the Research Network uh, on Macroeconomics uh, and Macroeconomic Policies, and a research associate of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts, uh, Amherst. Uh, she's got more than 80 uh, articles and, uh, and, uh, public, and, and, and book publications uh, in the top journals uh, in uh, the fields of economics, uh, development studies, and development um, economics. And I'm hugely excited to have uh, Oslem here uh, with us. If you want to tweet about this uh, seminar, please use hashtag SOASDEVSTUDIES or, or ESRC. Um, Oslim will speak for about 35 to 45 minutes or as long as she wants and that will be fine. And after that, uh, Professor Ben Fine from uh, the Department of Economics, uh, who is our discussant uh, today, Ben will speak for about five minutes uh, commenting on uh, whatever he wants to comment about uh, Oslem's presentation. And then Oslem may or may not decide to exercise instant revenge and respond <laughs> to Ben. Uh, and in any case, after they um, sort themselves out, we'll open for uh, questions. Um, okay, so Oslem, thank, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you, uh, Alfredo, for a very flattering introduction. <laughs> and thanks for having me here today. It's always uh, a great pleasure to come to SOAS. Uh, which is one of the most important centers in development uh, studies and development research. Uh, I have been asked to talk about uh, quite a few things uh, to please some competing constituencies uh, at SOAS, so hence the long title, which is building on 
a series of different uh, research that we've been doing at uh, Greenwich. Um, so what I will try to do is to walk you through first about uh, some stylized facts of rising inequality and uh, poor uh, performance of growth in the developing countries in parallel with also the developed world. And then I will try to tell you what we find about the impact of rising inequality and in particular falling share of labor income in the pie of national income uh, in terms of its effect on growth uh, and economic performance. Um, so this is something that we are uh, quite known for uh, at uh, Greenwich, our research on wage led growth. I will try to introduce uh, the empirical findings about that to you. And I know SOAS is the home of research uh, on financialization, so uh, I would be missing something if I also don't uh, mention some of the recent work we are doing on the impact of financialization on uh, investment and productivity in both emerging economies and uh, the developed world. And hopefully uh, driving on a lot of negative lessons from the past three and a half decades is illustrated by these empirical findings I will tell to you. I'll try to finish on a positive, optimistic note about alternative policies for uh, what I call an alternative equality-led and sustainable development uh, project. Okay, so here first is the uh, not so uh, optimistic part, uh, rather uh, gloomy experience of the last three and a half decades in the developing world. Uh, starting with uh, a series of neoliberal structural adjustment programs, um, massive increase in the integration to the global uh, economy uh, by the emerging economies, happening in the context of increasing financialization, and that, along with increasing technological change, is of course creating uh, a ground for rising inequality. We have to do, bear in mind all these things, neoliberal policies, globalization, financialization, technological change, are happening in the context of some very important human-made policy shifts related to changes in labor market institutions, and in particular, uh, changes in labor's organizational power, uh, and their impact on trade unions. And of course, neoliberal structure adjustment programs foremost also means austerity, uh, and this uh, cuts in public spending, in particular public investment, is also coming into this rather toxic, dangerous uh, mix. As a consequence of that mix, uh, research tells us that there has been a serious decrease in the bargaining power of labor, vis-a-vis -vis the bargaining power of uh, capital. So as the area of maneuver of capital increased, area of maneuver of labor narrowed down, what we had has been a dramatic decline in labor's income share in the pie of national income. That's what I will refer to uh, in the rest of the speech as fall in the white share or fall in the labor share in income. Now, a fall in the white share, just to be precise, doesn't mean the uh, wage rates are falling. It doesn't have to, at least. All it means is the rate of increase of wages, real wages, uh, after controlling for price increases, obviously, has been, uh, without an exception, uh, lower than the rate of increase of the productivity of labor, output per labor. So if you like, wage share is nothing but wage per person times the number of employees as a ratio to the national income pie which we refer to as the gross domestic product. So that's what I mean by a fall in labor share. It can happen even when real wages are increasing. Of course, there are years long episodes where real wages have also been falling, but abstracting from the details of that, what we have been observing is a secular, continual, and quite dramatic fall in the labor income share. Now, that has not uh, led to a good news in terms of growth and development performance. This has quite on the contrary gone along with a vicious circle of a global race to the bottom in the labor share simultaneously in all major economies and uh, either lower growth performance 
or more unstable, more volatile growth performance and fewer job creation or creation of bad quality precarious jobs. Now here is some of uh, Steinlein's facts about uh, what I've been summarizing so far. This is the graph of falling labor share. First I will talk about the major developing or emerging economies here. Uh, and in the next slide, I will show you the same story for the global north, or if you like, the developed world. Now, uh, this is adjusted wage share, the share of labor income and national income, adjusted for the labor income of self-employed people. The technical details, you can ask me later if you're interested in it. The data goes from 1970 to uh, the, the 2000s, and the uh, wage share in 1970 is equated to 100 for all countries, such that we can see the trend abstracting from the differences across uh, countries. Now, mind you, this is a data that is one of the most difficult uh, data to uh, get hold of. Income distribution, income inequality, and even wage data is uh, one of the best kept secrets of governments and statistics agencies. But after a lot of uh, search and trying to link different uh, data sets, we were able to uh, come up uh, with, uh, with that. Now, it looks like there is a lot of ups and downs there, but if you try to abstract from that, uh, in this big mess, what you see is that uh, starting from some time around 1980s uh, in Latin America, in Turkey, and later in uh, Asia, in particular in uh, Southeast Asia, starting from uh, mid-90s onwards, there is a secular decline in the labor share. The orders of magnitudes are quite significant. In some countries, this is about from the peak to the uh, bottom line in the 2000s, uh, there is some 30 percentage point redistribution away from cap uh, labor income towards capital income. The mirror image of the falling labor share is rising profit share. Basically, wages and profits add up to the total of the national income. So if this is falling, this means profit share is increasing by the same amount. Now, I said this is not a trend that is uh, just the problem of um, emerging, developing economies in the global south. Similar neoliberal policy packages in the context of globalization, financialization, and deterioration in labor's bargaining power took place in the developed world, in the global north as well. So this is the same data, labor share, again indexed to uh, 100 for the first year for the uh, developed part of the world. Now, if you, this data starts from 1960s, um, so basically it's a bit easier to find a long time series data for inequality for the developed part of the world, but it is still not going much uh, beyond that either. So again, here the picture is very clear. The decline in the wage share, maybe from its peak to 2000s, is just a bit more modest, but we are again talking about the redistribution away from wage income, labor income towards capital by orders of magnitudes of about 10 percentage points. So this is a massive change in the more equalizing trends in income distribution that we knew from the post-Second World War era. So what is happening here? Why is it happening is, of course, one question. But the thing I want to focus today is, what is the impact of that on development uh, and uh, growth? So, uh, by the way, the two graphs are covering uh, all the G20 economies. Uh, so basically, what we looked uh, in this piece of work was the 20 largest economies of the world that make up G20. There are about 10 developing economies and about 10 developed economies there. And altogether, G20 is making up about 85% of world income. So when I say global race to the bottom in labor share, uh, I really mean global, and it's summarized in these uh, two graphs. And if you were to look at smaller economies uh, in, in both the global north and the south, uh, and there is research on that too, the trend is sadly not very different. Now, um, I'm not going to talk about this large table here, but all it is to just pose a puzzle to you, maybe not to you, but uh, to a mainstream orthodox neoclassical economics. Labor share has been falling in the last three decades uh, everywhere in the world. 
Um, and if you look at the impact of that on growth, the impact is far from clear. So here in the first half of the panel, we have average growth in GDP in each decade from 70s to 2000s. And I'm cutting it before the Great Recession of 2008, because obviously after Great Recession uh, and a very slow or missing recovery afterwards, it's a very different uh, story. But the growth performance of some major developing economies, if you look at Turkey, uh, Mexico, Korea, um, along with this race to the bottom in labor share and rising profit share, their growth every decade is slowing down compared to the uh, 1970s. You could say, well, China uh, looks like an exception here. And of course, if apart from the lost decade of the 80s in Argentina, if you look at uh, 1990s or 2000s, actually growth is picking up. Okay, so there are differentiated effects. But it's far from clear that lower wage share, higher profit share will lead to better growth performance. And if you look at the global north, if you like, to Europe, uh, some large uh, G20 members uh, within Europe or the US, Japan, Canada, Australia, it's very clear. Every decade, along with rising profitability, falling labor share, growth has been uh, lower and it has been also more volatile if you look at the details of the data. So, um, what does that mean for economic performance? Now, I didn't make up this title. This is from the Financial Times um, after a speech I had given, not at SOAS, not at Greenwich, but Investment Fund Managers Conference in London, organized by Hermes Investment Fund. So the journalist was in the audience. He heard the sort of speech uh, that I started giving now. And he had, uh, I think, summarized it may better than I can do, so I'm using it therefore. Uh, capital gobbles labor share, but victory is empty. I should also add that the uh, uh, session at this investment fund managers conference was titled Labor's uprising question mark. Investment fund managers were really concerned about the instability that can result out of rising inequality. So uh, we, ha we may have our good concerns uh, about fairness uh, and equality uh, as a value in its own, but also if you're concerned about growth uh, and stability in an economy, um, you need to be concerned about inequality. And fund managers understand that, though um, it doesn't always uh, go down the route of, uh, of course, policy influence. Now, here is another story. Is there anyone from Korea, South Korea? Or is there anyone who can read South Korean? All right, so you could maybe translate the title uh, for us. Um, we were invited to South Korea in uh, October, and then there was um, uh, an interview at the newspaper uh, afterwards, one of the uh, leading uh, daily progressive newspapers. Uh, the title, as my journalist friends tell me, reads apparently, and please check if I am told correct by the journalist, distribution is not the result of growth, but the source of growth. Uh, and then in another place, apparently it says, when wages raised, productivity will also be raised. Now here is the story. Uh, I've been doing that sort of research since I was a student. Um, and we haven't been quite uh, successful in changing, reversing the tide in terms of economic policy impact. South Korea has very recently elected a progressive president. They've invited us to talk about policies that can foster equality along with growth. Uh, and then uh, they made their civil servants working for government departments listen to us. By the way, those civil servants are all trained in Ivy League universities in the US, trained very well in neoclassical economics, certainly not in any of the type of alternative economics I will be talking about today. It was all news to them. They had to diligently sit half, an hour, half a day in the same room for us, listen to our research and try to understand it and ask questions to us. Meaning it lo looks like policies are changing or at least policymakers are starting to listen to alternative economics only if you change the government. <laughs> so it's not happening the other way around, at least not in my experience. But uh, so I'll try to tell you why distribution, income distribution, isn't necessarily something 
that comes with more growth, or equality doesn't miraculously happen as an outcome of growth, as the mainstream would tell us, but rather income distribution has crucial effects on growth and development. This is what I'll try to explain. Now, without going into any formal economics, there is some common sense. If you look at neoclassical mainstream orthodox economics, in their models, in their theories, and in their empirical work, wages of the workers are just a cost item. Higher wages means higher costs, lower wages means lower costs, higher profitability, and they would expect, they theorize that, this would be a good thing for private investment, for export performance, and eventually for growth, and the benefits of higher profits will eventually trickle down to the rest of the population and workers in the form of also jobs uh, eventually. Now, in our models, in our alternative heterodox, uh, if I may be precise, post-Keynesian, uh, inspired by Keynes, but also Marx, um, if I dare to say general models, wages are not just a cost item. We do acknowledge that wages are, of course, a, uh, a source of cost for businesses, but we also say that they have a dual role. Crucially, they are the most important source of demand in an economy. Um, so when you decrease wages, to be precise, when you decrease the wage share, like it has happened across the board in the last three decades, actually this will have an effect on demand. It will affect all components of private demand. Private demand is composed of households consumption, investment of private businesses, and net exports, meaning exports minus imports. So when you decrease wages, I can bet on everything I have, it's not much, but for me, it's everything I have, that it will have a negative effect on domestic consumption. Uh, if anybody is uh, interested in doing some very simple statistical analysis, you can see that very clearly. There are very few uh, things that give me such an easy ride. The impact of falling wage share on consumption is negative. Why? For a very simple reason. The poor have a higher propensity to consume compared to the rich. You could say the rich consume a lot, then the poor in absolute amounts, you're right, but compared to as a ratio to their income, the poor will consume all their income and maybe even take some loans if they can, and the rich will consume maybe less than half of their income. They will save a lot. So if you redistribute away from the poor to the rich, or to be more precise for our purposes, take away from labor to, uh, and give to capital, uh, you will uh, lead to a fall in consumption of households in the aggregate economy. So you will have a negative effect coming from a fall in the white share on consumption. You could, you could be forgiven uh, to expect it, but there may be a positive stimulus to private investment because profit share is increasing at the same time. Um, this is not that easy to prove, but I am happy to accept at least the a theoretical argument, but we learn from Keynes also private investment does not just respond to profitability. They actually look at sales prospects, business expectations. That's shaped by what is happening to demand. So at the end of the day, you have to see how sensitive investment to, is to profit versus demand and what will happen to demand once you dump wages. So the ultimate effect of a falling wage share, rising profit share on private investment is actually ambiguous. Uh, but there is a positive partial stimulus, which we can expect. The third effect on net exports, again, uh, it's fair to expect that lower wage share means lower unit labor costs as well. That will raise international competitiveness and you will get some positive impact on net exports. But there is terribly uh, difficult to pin down because it will depend on multiple parameters. It will depend on how sensitive is your export prices to labor costs. If you are China, you are exporting a lot of very labor intensive stuff, so obviously the pass through from labor costs to prices will be high. Whereas it won't be the same if you are South Korea. 
Uh, and also it will depend what type of goods you're exporting, hence how sensitive are your exports to a change in prices. So there are many parameters that you have to know here, and same thing applies for imports as well. So if you have treatings here, when wage share falls, one negative effect on consumption, one partial positive effect on private investment, and then one positive effect on net exports. If you sum the three up, what do you expect? Would it be positive or negative? Does anyone? Who would expect it to be uh, positive? If you decrease the white share, the three of them all together add up to your aggregate demand in the economy, in the private sector. Now, abstracting from the public sector. I'm decreasing consumption, increasing investment and net exports. What would be the, the sum be? A positive change or a fall, a negative effect? Who thinks it's negative? Okay. Who thinks it's positive? Now, this is what, what happens when you come to SOAS. Okay, <laughs> theoretically speaking, it can be anything. I don't know which effect will be dominant. There is a negative effect on consumption and a positive impact on investment and net exports. It could well be positive if the other two positive effects on investment and net exports are dominating. However, it may be negative as well. So, in a way, the ones that didn't say anything are probably thinking it's ambiguous. Why should I now answer? Which was also correct. So, if the total effect is positive, this is an economy where lower wage share will lead to higher demand and eventually higher growth. That's an economy which we call a profit-led economy. The demand regime is profit-led, meaning if you decrease wage share, increase profit share, you're going to get more growth. If you like, neoclassical economists think all our economies are profit-led and they give the same advice to all of us, so I assume that boils down to also thinking the world economy as a whole is profit-led. Well, as some of you rightly, however, expected, the effect may well be negative as well. So a lower wage share and a higher profit share then will lead to lower growth, fewer jobs, and this is an, an economy which we call a wage-led demand regime. Mind you, in a wage-led economy, if you're decreasing the wage share, that's really bad for growth. That will lead to stagnation uh, in demand. Um, so I use the term here wage-led, broadly speaking, but you could uh, broaden that analysis to the impact of inequality uh, at large. We are now working on, for example, the impact of gender inequality on growth, and therefore I, I like talking about equality-led regime, where higher equality leads to more growth. Now, this is why we claim that this is a general model, because uh, theoretically speaking, the impact can be both positive or negative, um, so we don't know. We have to look at the parameters of the economy. Now, you would be forgiven by looking at the stylized facts I summarized you at the beginning, falling wage share, lower growth in at least some of the economies, they should, they look like they are wage-led, and they would pose a puzzle for neoclassical economists. Now, what did we do? Of course, I know everyone would like to now go to this party next door, but um, <laughs> um, I'm grateful that you're still uh, bearing with me. So we have looked at the impact of rising inequality falling wage share, as I said, for G20 economies. That was the work we did for United Nations International Labour Office with my colleague Yorgos Galanis. And we have also looked at that for every single Western European Union member state, in addition to the aggregate or large uh, European Union analysis we had for the G20 uh, study. Uh, for a recent work we did uh, for Foundation of European Progressive Studies with my PhD student Thomas Obst. What we do is very simple. We estimate the impact of falling wage share or a change in wage share and consumption on private investment on exports and imports, going through also its impact on prices, so it's a bit tedious there. Then what we say is any change in these three components of private uh, demand will have also further repercussions uh, for uh, the national economy. It will further affect consumption and investment and imports, so the so-called multiplier effects, if you have taken an introduction to economics course. 
Then what we do is we ask uh, a more interesting question, in my opinion. We say, look, this is not happening in just one country at a time. It's happening globally. It's a race to the bottom in all global uh, north and global south. So what happens when white share falls, not just in your country in isolation, not just in Turkey, in South Korea, uh, in India, in China, but it's also falling in your trade partners in Europe and the US and so on. So how is that fall in the weight share in your trade partner affecting their export prices, which is your import prices? And how is that change in inequality in your trade partners affecting demand uh, in their home economy and hence their GDP, which is basically, from your perspective, the foreign GDP, which will affect then your exports? We try to simulate the fullness of this global interactions. And here is what we found. First of all, if you decrease the white share, the impact on consumption is really very strong. There is uh, some positive effect on investment, not in all countries, and wherever there is even a positive stimulus on investment, that is very small compared to the big negative effect on domestic consumption. So if you were to think of an economy that is not trading with other countries, which is closed, those domestic regimes are surely wage-led. Of course, we do accept that uh, countries are trading with each other. So if you add on top of this negative domestic demand effect of rising inequality, falling wage share, also the impact that comes from net exports, that effect is positive, but it's not large enough to offset the negative effect again on consumption. So what we find, in particular in large economies, both in the global north uh, and to some extent in the global south, demand is wage-led, certainly in the EU as a whole, uh, in the US, uh, in Japan, um, but also in some important developing economies that South Korea and Turkey demand was wage-led. In isolation, by the way, not in all developing economies demand was uh, wage-led. In isolation, you would find some countries quite a few of those G20 members in the global south, Mexico, uh, India, China, South Africa, Argentina, who seem to be profit-led. But what was very interesting was when there is a race to the bottom in all the economies in terms of declining wage share at the same time, those, some of the smaller uh, emerging economies like Mexico, India, um, Argentina, we're not able to grow anymore, precisely because of the reason I have mentioned. It's not wage share isn't only falling in Mexico and Argentina, but it's falling at the same time in the US, in Canada, in their trade partners, as well as their competitors. Uh, let's say it's falling at the same time in Asia or in other Latin American economies. That is basically wiping off any benefit you can get from falling labor costs on your uh, foreign demand and it exports, hence you're left with only those very strong negative domestic demand effects, particularly originating from lower consumption demand of the uh, households. Okay, so overall, just to summarize the big picture, if there is a one percentage point fall in the weight share, if weight share falls from 60% of national income to 59%, in each country, at the same time, in G20, in 85% of the global economy, that's leading to a fall in global GDP. The fall in uh, developing economies such as South Korea is even stronger. Um, and uh, in Europe, you also get quite a uh, strong impact. Now, to reverse that and think of an optimistic uh, end to that uh, negative finding or negative experience, we simulated uh, a scenario where the wage share increased in all the economies of the world, including China, including South Africa, which remains to be very profit-led demand regimes, even in a race to the bottom uh, constellation. Uh, what we found was it's possible to increase the wage share even in those strongly profit-led developing economies if we start increasing it here at home in Europe, in the US, and in other wage-led economies. 
at a stronger amount. So we basically try to simulate uh, a scenario where some economies go back to the more egalitarian years of um, late 70s, mid 70s. Some other economies have a smaller area of money where they increase the wage share by, let's say, only 3% of national income. Others have even a smaller area of money, but they're all able to increase their wage share. That's giving us 3% more global GDP. In Korea, South Korea, the impact was very strong, 7%. And in Europe, the impact is again very strong by about 2.4% of uh, higher uh, GDP. Now, um, all it is teaching me one very important uh, of, of, uh, lesson. First of all, higher inequality, higher profit share isn't leading to more investment. On top of that, some, uh, something uh, in addition to rising inequality very fundamentally happened in these last three decades, and that was uh, financialization. Financialization has very significantly contributed to the breakup of the link between profitability and investment. So what we see is a rise in profits, but very stagnant uh, investment, private investment performance. And this is the case both again in developing and developed economies. To pin that down, what we looked uh, uh, at was the performance of particularly non-financial corporations. Financialization is a very broad concept, uh, but there is a dimension of that that has fundamentally changed the behavior of also the non-financial sector. So what we looked at was the financial activities of non-financial corporations, very broadly defined. Because if you think of the mainstream literature uh, in favor of financial liberalization, one of the key ideas there is more financial liberalization, the so-called financial development, will create more funds, more savings, and therefore more funds for private investment. Well, really, this is not happening in uh, some of the key large emerging economies that we have looked at. We found very strong negative effect coming from financial activities of non-financial uh, companies defined as their dividend payments to their shareholders, as well as their interest payments, but not just the financial payments, but also uh, their financial revenues were having a negative effect on the investment of non-financial corporations. So you could think financial revenues, if a, a non-financial corporation is buying a government bond or buying the shares of another company, it's going to bring in revenue and it may uh, eventually lead to higher investment. No, financial activities is diverting non-financial corporations away from their core businesses and leading to a negative impact on their investment. This is the recent finding uh, we have with Daniele Torre uh, for a project that we have done for UNCTAD uh, at, at the United Nations. Now, interestingly, there were two emerging economies, China and India, that didn't fit into that pattern. Otherwise, we were eager to call the paper Race to the Bottom in Investment, along with financialization. Uh, but this negative effect of financial activities, financial revenues and payments on private investment is just not happening in India and China. There's no significant effect. So obviously, I know uh, you're working on also financialization in China and India, and it has also gone quite far. But in terms of the corporate governance about what private companies are doing in the non-financial sphere, they surely are very different from Brazil, Turkey, Mexico, South Korea, or South Africa. So there's a lesson to be learned there. But this intermingling of financialization, inequality, obviously, is leading to a poor private investment performance. Uh, investment, in our experience, empirically, is not very responsive to profitability, but it is very strongly responding to demand. So if you cut demand with higher uh, inequality, higher financialization, which, by the way, is also feeding into high inequality, where you get is this toxic mix of financialization and inequality leading to low investment. So obviously, that will lead to low productivity and, uh, uh, and, and a poor performance in terms of development. It's not really a puzzle. OK, so often when I talk about um, changing the tide, um, I'm asked, well, how can you reverse all these trends in the era of globalization and financialization? 
Now, um, here is the kind of uh, ideas that we need to become aware. First of all, the rationale that works for a single firm at the micro level doesn't work at the macro national level. For example, you could be forgiven that cutting wages in a single company may help profits, investment and growth, though you're probably ignoring all the impact of cutting wages on morale and productivity, but you could be forgiven to believe that it could work. Not in this audience, but in some other audience. But the logic is if you add what works for one firm at the country level, national level, if your economy is operating in a wage led demand regime, that's not going to add up. There is a fallacy of composition between the micro versus the macro logic. Similarly, you could be forgiven that your small economy, uh, Mexico uh, or uh, Thailand, um, and you rely on export demand a lot, and if you cut wages, you could really uh, make your way through higher international competitiveness to higher growth uh, through wage moderation. But what can work, maybe for one single small economy, if it's the only genius in the world, will not work if all the capitalists follow uh, suit. Now, the, uh, as you have seen, neither capitalists in Europe nor in the US or in the uh, developing world are alone in uh, trying to implement policies that have led to this race to the bottom in the white chair. So when all countries are doing the same, the positive impact that a small open economy may get in isolation from lowering wage costs will not add up because all your trade partners are doing the same. So the national logic doesn't add up to a regional logic. Again, to reverse that, you could it's a small open economy, you could be worried that if I'm the only country in the world who would increase wages, I will lose a lot in terms of international demand. I'm being asked this question all the time. Well, this is why we need to talk to us. This is why regional cooperation and trying to cater for a larger uh, regional bloc may help if all your, of course, uh, regional partners are eager to opt for a high road labor market policy trying to reverse rising inequality. Now, on a negative note, though, when all the countries are trying to gain a competitive edge by implementing the same wage moderation policies, there is a limit to success because everyone is doing the same and you're wiping out each other's competitiveness by uh, this race to the bottom. So in a highly integrated global economy, a race to the bottom in labor share is not going to deliver more growth and more jobs for anyone. Um, and here is the interesting now um, puzzle, if you like. We could think that globalization makes it very difficult uh, for countries to follow egalitarian policies because you're more likely to be a profit-led regime when net exports are very important for your country. But globalization isn't just about increase in trade, it's also about contagion of policies. So political globalization, application of the same sort of labor market policies leading to a fall in the wage share in all countries is making actually each country more likely to be a, prof, a, a wage-led economy as opposed to be as opposed to a profit-led economy. Um, sorry, there is a typo there. It should have said globalization, uh, political globalization will make countries uh, to be more likely to be wage-led. Okay, I'm saying it later down there, so there is no typo. This is correct, and the one about is correct too. And here is the thing I have said before in terms of um, some of the economies which you could think, looking at my simple uh, bivariate growth table at the beginning, uh, along with falling weight share, uh, growth has increased in Argentina, you could have told me. Um, well, there is also some uh, developed economies there who could fall into that uh, group. But when all these countries at the same time are doing the race to the bottom, in the labor share, they're actually not able to grow out of that. And I really like this finding because particularly if you look at um, NAFTA, Mexico, Canada, the US are in a trade block. Mexico seems to be in isolation a profit-led economy. Canada is also in isolation in our findings, at least looks like a profit-led economy, meaning if they are the only country in the world decreasing white share, they would grow. But they are not the only country doing it, they are doing it with their major trade partner, the US, in NAFTA, 
together in North American free trade uh, uh, area. So what we are getting out of that is Mexico, Canada, US, they're all contracting along with rising inequality. Same applies to uh, India, which I thought was a very interesting policy lesson. Now, and I did tell you that at least econometrically, statistically, we found that uh, falling wage share led to uh, lower demand and lower growth in the global economy. To me, it makes a lot of sense because, mind you, I also emphasize that our domestic economy, meaning just the sum of household consumption and private investment, would contract along with falling wage share because I said domestic demand is wage led. Now, if you think of the world, what would have made world a profit-led economy would have been a very large trade with some other economy outside the world to turn around this negative effect on the domestic demand of the world. Now, the world, however, as of now, to, our, to the best of our knowledge, is a closed economy because we are not trading with Mars. And this is a finding I really like because it's very intuitive. And I also like science fiction. Obviously, if we start trading with Mars, my analysis would not be valid anymore. I would have to think of um, the amount of trade with Mars and how important it will be. It will also depend, however, the wage policies of the Martians. Now, before I go into the details of science fiction, let me try to finish on this positive note again. We try to simulate um, these policies for G20, as I said. And the labor institutions that are trying to provide input uh, to G20, international trade unions, asked me to provide a piece to the 2014 G20 meeting. And what we did there was to say, look, reversing inequality is possible. That is going to create more growth if you all do the same. And for heaven's sake, you're meeting uh, as G20. The whole idea should be to coordinate policies. You can do that. Um, however, the growth that can be generated by reversing inequality is small. If you want to create decent uh, amount of jobs for everyone, you need to do more than that. And that would require public investment. So we simulated a policy mix of rising public investment in all G20 economies at the same time and rising wage share every year by a small amount but in each country through the good policies, high road labor market policies, I would say you're getting a very strong stimulus in G20 with that. Okay, um, so what do we need to, to address the key challenges of our time? For me, this is uh, policies to achieve equality, uh, full employment and ecological sustainability. First of all, you need public investment, so you need the state to lead the way. You need labor market policies for an equality-led uh, uh, growth policy. And you need, of course, to reverse financialization uh, and change corporate governance. Now, I did promise to talk a little bit about uh, what are these policies, so let me just very briefly give you the headlines. Uh, in terms of the labor market policies, you need policies that would change the distribution in the marketplace. And this is not rocket science. We know why wage share fell. Well, we can change those human-made policies to reverse that. So it is about creating institutions. And here again, the role of the state is very important. It's about reversing the trade union legislation. It's about making trade unions legal as opposed to something uh, uh, on which you can lose your uh, life. It's about regulating the labor market. It's about getting rid of the excessive flexibility in the labor contract such as zero hours contracts. It's about improving union legislation. It's about creating institutions to increase the coverage of collective bargaining. Uh, that is uh, 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 an outcome of, of course, also stronger union uh, power. It's also about uh, closing gender pay gaps. Uh, it's about ensuring that equal value of work is equal paid. Again, these are all coming from some other uh, research we are doing with Alexander Gushansky, who is also actually teaching as a tutor at SOAS. Um, but uh, high gender pay gaps is one of the uh, key reasons of falling white share. So if you try to reverse that by make, making sure uh, gender wage gaps are closed, you're going to go a far uh, way. And again, minimum wages, something very simple 
plays a big role, not just for the low-skilled, low-educated workers, but even for the medium and high-educated uh, workers. Higher minimum wages leads to higher wage share. Obviously, this is all about pre-distribution so far, what I said. Redistribution, meaning progressive taxation, is as important as uh, pre-distribution, also in terms of reversing inequality. And I said public investment is key, and here we have a very broad understanding of public investment, not just in physical infrastructure for ecological sustainability, but also in social infrastructure. Uh, with that, feminists mean purple investment in education, childcare, uh, health and uh, social care. This is, of course, about socialising the otherwise invisible unpaid work women are doing. And the good thing about social infrastructure is it's creating a lot of jobs, a lot of demand. It's massively uh, equalising. And, of course, it's giving a big boost uh, to demand. So I'll end by saying, if you want equitable and sustainable development, you need green and purple public investment with decent pay for both men and women. And you could be forgiven for uh, thinking that how are we going to finance that, what will be the budget impact. I will just say, by rephrasing from Keynes, take care of full employment and then extend it a little bit, take care of also equality for men and women and ecological sustainability. Your budget actually does take care of itself, meaning if you implement these policies, the impact of that on your budget will also be positive. That's uh, the finding of another piece of research. I'll end here and see how far the time Ben will now give to me. Thank you, Aslan. This is uh, absolutely fascinating. We uh, criticize neoliberal uh, economic policies, uh, conventional uh, adjustment programs. But we need to have also an alternative. We need to have a source of inspiration to mobilize people. And this is precisely the work that Oslem has been leading, uh, designing policies that, are, that run counter to the mainstream and counter to neoliberalism, and that can be effective. So thanks very much for that. Uh, ben. OK. Uh, PhD students will be pleased to know this is my chance to be famous for five minutes. Um, let me begin by saying that Osam's given a compelling, eloquent, and invaluable case for identifying and remedying some of, some, I would say, of mechanisms by which contemporary capitalism is caught, to some degree, unevenly in what I've called the four lows. Low investment, low productivity, low wages, and low employment. And this creates a vicious circle, and the task is to try and see how this can be transformed into a virtuous circle of the four highs. And uh, the case is made for the public sector playing a leading role in investment and social wage. Uh, time is short for me, so I can't go into many of the things in detail, but I think the first point I would make is the relationship between the four lows, or indeed the four highs, is much more complex than, than is, has been laid out. The grand, if you like, methodological, theoretical and historical question is whether national capitalisms can be divided into these two types, ideal types of profit-led or wage-led. Um, um, as the basis for understanding uh, their performance uh, just by virtue of uh, these uh, simple dualisms. And obviously my reason, my argument is, it's not quite as simple as that, although it does identify some of, some of the mechanisms involved. Um, in particular, uh, Oslim identifies one new kid on the block, not so new now, maybe a teenager, and two old ones. The new kid on the block is finance, which is seen as speculative and undermining levels of investment. Uh, the other two older kids are globalization, which is characterized as bringing about uh, a race to the bottom. And the third old kid is the state, 
which I presume as, is seen as having been captured by austerity and financial interests. Otherwise, I presume it would be possible for state expenditure to take the place of the reduced wage share in an uh, increasing demand. And the issue is, as I think laid out very, very clearly, how do we reverse these uh, roles to get to the four highs? Uh, in the old days, during the post-war boom, uh, the answer used to be Scandinavia or Germany or Japan. I think the answer today would be China. I'm not sure it's India. I just wanted to add one other point here, um, which is that the, uh, since the global financial crisis, the neoliberal response has been to continue to support finance, almost without limit, in the mistaken belief that this will promote indirectly either investment or consumption demand. But this has not worked at all, as we know, and has merely sustained financialization and its speculative profitability. Perhaps I want to move on to say, though, that um, partly because of the ideal typing between the two types of regime, um, somewhat static picture is created of the situation, and I want to argue that the situation is changing uh, currently and possibly quite significantly. And my starting point is that is, is uh, some research, research that's being done on the role of globally organized uh, multinational corporations, whether financial or non-financial. And what we know is that somewhere between three or four hundred multinational corporations basically run the world. And two-thirds of these are financial companies. Um, and actually, what we're witnessing at the moment is a degree of movement in two ways which, in a sense, have not been recognized by Oslem and which create challenges for us in implementing our policies or the policies that she's suggesting. The first is, there is uh, an increasing move towards state-led industrial policy to integrate globally organized finance and industry. I'll give an example of that uh, in a minute. Uh, but this is happening on a global scale. It's the global organization of these moves which are very, very important. And the second thing that's happening, it overlaps with and complements the first, is state-led support for, for private financing of private infrastructure. So these are two big things which are happening at the moment, relatively new. And Oslem's analysis is primarily pitched uh, at the national level, with the global as the aggregate of those nationals. And rightly points, in my view, I'm not saying this is wrong, but rightly pointing to the considerable scope in current conditions for national expansions across uh, economic and social wages, as well as industrial policy and public investment. But if we, for example, I can only pick out one example, I could give many more, if we look at the nuclear power program in Great Britain, this is about Chinese finance, it's about French technology, and it's about British nuclear power. And this is the way in which uh, the problems of coordinating industry with finance, growth with finance and development is currently taking place. And this is going to happen then along lines that fracture rather than strengthen the capacity to make national economic policy. And so that's the point I really want to, to put forward that the I have no problem in looking at the scope for and the potential for making national policies along the lines that Oslo has put forward. I don't even need that, sorry. Uh, but we have to locate that not only within a framework of what's called methodological nationalism, that is looking at what is happening within the state and seeing the global as simply the interaction between the states. Increasingly our world is one which is, as I said, fractured 
by the organization of very, very powerful multinational corporations. And the process of struggling for alternative policies will have to deal with those issues and not just ones of influencing the scale and form of national policy, but how these interact with severe battles with globally organized, financialized multinational corporations. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Would you like to respond to that? I anyone? would love to respond to that, Please. but I'll put up the slide with references because um, I think uh, a lot of what I said is uh, written uh, in some of these papers, which, by the way, you can always download from our, our Greenwich Political Economy Research Centre website. Now, uh, uh, I, I, I think I agree with Ben. Um, either uh, I was too quick or um, one needs to go to uh, the papers and look at the details, uh, Ben, but this is exactly what we are trying to avoid. We are avoiding a na methodological nationalism here. We're trying to look at the interactions across countries. And um, it's very important, I think, to recognize what a single country alone uh, can do in its uh, national borders uh, without coordinating with any other country, if it's the only country in the world to opt for more progressive, high-road labor market policies um, versus uh, what can be achieved if you coordinate these policies. Uh, the area of maneuver is certainly narrow uh, if you're an open economy um, in the world of globalization and financialization, uh, for sure. This is why coordination is very important. Uh, well, this is why we try to work and talk with international trade unions such that they try to make these interventions uh, at the global level. Uh, however, I also don't want to sound uh, that there is nothing we can do if uh, we can't achieve a simultaneous change in uh, a, a significant number of countries. So there is, of course, something that can be done even if you're South Korea, who is the only country who has elected a progressive government on earth, and they want to increase the minimum wage, uh, do some state uh, spending to reverse inequality, but also to improve the lives of people, well-being of people, invest in uh, education, childcare, and stuff like that. Yes, I want to tell them, yes, you can do that. But of course, if your trade partners are doing exactly the opposite of your, uh, what you're doing, it's going to narrow down your space. So that invites uh, the idea that, well, you're an important country, you can try to be the policy leader. You can try to export these good policies. Of course, it's a lot easier to say that when you're speaking, say, in the context of the European Union. European Union has been very successful in coordinating the bad policies. European Commission's whole policy advice is that Europe has to do wage moderation to become more the most competitive economy in the world. Plus, of course, European <coughs> Union is a very powerful actor in the IMF and the World Bank, who is giving policy advice to not just uh, European economies who need bailout packages like Greece, but also to the rest of the world, that you need more flexible labor markets, which. Uh, and, and minimum wages are really harming uh, employment and so on. So we have been good in coordinating bad policies. Yes, if we want, we can coordinate the good policies. But again, I don't want to uh, be pessimistic that if you can't uh, change Europe and the US, there's nothing you can do uh, in the global south. For example, when I spoke about that in South Africa, I said South Africa is a very large economy. And if you were to really think of a southern uh, African uh, trade bloc, by also trying to have uh, some policy synchronization to increase equality. If you were to be the policy leader of that, uh, you could depend on that large South African market and boost uh, demand by boosting wages and opt for also more space for industrial policy along with the good policies as opposed to industrial policy that's being used at the moment to foster again the multinationals, as Ben has uh, mentioned. I wish to also add one more thing here. Um, we look actually a lot at what multinationals are doing. Uh, the financialization analysis we do uh, is based on the balance sheets of multinationals consolidated budgets. So we are basically looking at their global activities 
and yes, their uh, global financial activities is uh, hampering uh, their investment. And similarly, a lot of the fall in the white share, of course, is related to offshoring, um, particularly uh, the rise in intermediate tr uh, uh, trade, uh, trade and intermediate goods in the global value chains. Uh, however, I dare to say, the impact of globalization is more or less offset, uh, or could be offset, by the role of trade unions. If you like, there is a negative effect coming from globalization, particularly the globalization of capital, and by the way, not migration. Uh, as a migrant, I feel the need to emphasize that. Uh, but there is a very strong positive effect that can come from stronger trade unions and uh, higher coverage of uh, collective bargaining or higher minimum wages. So basically, if we hadn't had the fall in labor's bargaining power, uh, we could have offset all the negative effects that were coming from this powerful globalization and the rise of multinationals on the white share. Uh, so globalization took place in the context of a massive institutional and political change in terms of what the state is doing, what legislation, uh, the direction in which the legislation, labor market legislation has changed. Hence, we are having these uh, negative effects. Thus, uh, I think this is again all in our powers uh, to reverse despite globalization and despite technological change, by the way, if anyone is interested in uh, robots coming, what's going to happen to inequality. Yes, all this can be mediated by the good institutions that give more muscle power to labor vis-a-vis -vis capital. At least this is what we are learning from historical evidence. I'll stop here because I'm sure there will be more comments. Um, else we can have a conversation if no one else wants to pick up. Thank you very much, Alvin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, time for questions, uh, comments, our group. Uh, two or three or four questions uh, at a time and ask Alvin to respond to them. Yes, please. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want you to win. No, yes. No, no, no. Make it loud. Hello. That's good. This is strong. Yes. Uh, the, the point you made regarding the link between profit and investment. I, I just well, was wondering how much it's got to do with the elite uh, taking their capital, their wealth, and putting it in overseas shell companies. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes. Hi. Um, I was just wondering what you think the development of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank and the One Belt, One Road policy of China will do for development studies? Sorry, it's the last part. Can you repeat? Um, for the Asia Infrastructure Development Bank and the One Belt, One Road initiative. Thank you. Any additional questions for this round? Yes. Hi. Do you think that re-incentivizing many of those multinational super firms that you mentioned to invest in productive industries or just industries in the real economy as opposed to the financial economy is needed to also kind of reconnect wages and profits as opposed to profits just being connected to the explosion of finance and financial products and their values? Thanks. Thanks very much. Osman, would you like to... Yes. Um, <laughs> this is uh, already a lot of uh, material here. Um, I mean, tech savings is a, a very important problem, obviously, for, uh, for states and uh, being able to raise uh, the, the revenues they need from the multinationals despite increasing profitability. However, looking from a neoclassical lens, you would expect tech savings to, since they are leaving more profits uh, for the firms rather than uh, getting them taxed to lead to higher investment, which it's also not happening. Uh, basically, there is a very clear case that if uh, we can increase corporate tax rights and close tax loopholes, coordinate again globally uh, to make sure that multinationals can't uh, do this race to the bottom in terms of corporate tax rights and use uh, legislation uh, and countries against each other, this is not necessarily gonna hurt investment because whenever we talk about 
higher corporate taxation, we are being accused by being very old-fashioned and going back to 70s and this will surely hurt investment. Whereas we are seeing empirically exactly the opposite. Actually, multinationals are very successful in avoiding taxes and they are not investing. And I emphasize, we are working in this piece that I mentioned about non-financial corporations with their global balance sheets. So basically, it's all their global investment and global profits. Their investment is so insensitive to their profits and the reason being, they're sitting on their profits and buying the shares of other companies or buying back their own shares, even worse, uh, rather than investing. And surely uh, the incentives that neoliberalism is trying to give to the firms in terms of law taxation and so on uh, is not leading to a high investment. Uh, but yes, uh, tax evidence is a problem from a nation state perspective, the capacity to tax perspective, and coordination is therefore also very important. And this is also why it's a pity that Britain is uh, leaving the EU because it, it could have been used as uh, an area of maneuver to increase coordination also globally. Um, in, from here, may I jump to the incentives? Um, the most important incentive I can think about uh, for private investment uh, to provoke their animal spirits and business expectations such as they invest is the state again uh, showing the way by uh, creating the infrastructure that, uh, and, and of course creating the demand. I think of uh, some key in, uh, industries where we need public investment for social reasons anyway. This is for me uh, public transport, housing, renewable energy, but also uh, the care economy, education uh, and health. Uh, but this, this is also the kind of thing that will create a business environment if you want to stimulate private investment, if this is what you're interested in. But I, I agree additionally with you that corporate governance has to think how uh, we can give invest, investors incentives for long-term investment as opposed to short-term speculation, short-sighted speculation that needs to look at what needs to be taxed, basically uh, you can imagine having a lower uh, corporate tax rate on uh, retained profits which will be reinvested in their core uh, activities, core business versus much higher corporate uh, tax rate uh, on profits that are not retained for investment in core businesses. Uh, there are other ways you can uh, think very radically uh, about corporate governance, obviously, uh, about dividend policies, but surely something has to be done about shareholder value orientation at the corporation level, so I agree with you totally on that. Um, now, in terms of the Asian Development Bank, obviously, um, it depends on the countries that are having, the policies of the countries that are having stakes in that. Is it going to be something that is going to impose neoliberal policies or is it going to be something that will lead to a new developmentalist paradigm? Unless you change uh, the major uh, uh, governments, uh, their stakeholders in Asian Development Bank, you're not going to use that bank for the kind of uh, initiatives that I would like to see. I would, I would like to see conditionalities for loans, uh, but conditionalities that involve, of course, uh, working conditions and the firms, uh, they will benefit from loans. I would like to see prioritization of some key uh, industries in green physical infrastructure and purple social infrastructure. Uh, currently, Sydney, I don't see that uh, happening. Um, and uh, again, um, thinking of China, particularly Chinese activities in Africa, uh, they're actually not at the moment a source of uh, development with equality. Uh, the situation in China itself in terms of uh, wage developments are of course uh, slightly better, but um, my understanding of uh, high road labor market policies is of course a lot broader than the wage developments. It's about collective voice, um, uh, it's about rights uh, such that we can make sure that those developments uh, will uh, apply to everyone and will be uh, permanent. Um, so at the moment um, I don't see that also for a locomotive, uh, for change for better. 
Uh, but obviously, there are some other things uh, that one has to t learn from China, though again, these are policies that it's not exporting when it operates in uh, Africa at the moment. Um, how they manage to use the state uh, to give impetus to investment, how uh, the difference in the impact of financialization on the non-financial corporations in China, um, it's again very different from, uh, say, Brazil or South Africa. So there are things about capital controls that one has to learn, but again, we are also seeing a reversal in these. Um, so at the moment, um, more management, more state involvement is the positive thing I'm happy to take from China, but it's not my development model, sadly. And it is a very strong uh, global power, um, so change in China for the better will be important. Um. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I've got two questions. Um, and my, my first question is, is about um, the experiences with uh, policies similar, perhaps, uh, to those that you have been uh, suggesting. Um, if you think of the example of Latin America, think of Brazil or Venezuela, aren't these countries that have attempted to implement policies of pulling the economy through uh, Rate by raising wages, and neither country did very well. So, what, what does that suggest in terms of the applicability of the policies you're recommending here? And the second has to do with something that you just mentioned in your uh, response just a moment ago uh, about capital controls. Now, if you, if you imagine that um, there's a good possibility, I, I suppose and I hope, that at the next election in this country, uh, the Labour Party would be ahead in the opinion polls. And you have a hemorrhage of capital fleeing the country because um, of the uh, possible threat that a Corbyn administration would represent for large capital. Now, for developing countries, it's very, sim it's very simple. We suggest capital controls because we want to hold capital inside that country. But that's not the case for Britain because Britain lives off the trafficking of capital from one part of the world to the other. So what happens to the city? And what happens to the, what, 600,000 people or more perhaps who work in the city of London if we impose that uh, type of control? Uh, before I call anyone else, we have a reception just after this uh, seminar in the staff common room on the first floor. Everyone is invited. There's food and drink for everybody. And, um, yeah, everyone will be uh, most welcome to come. Other questions, comments, ideas? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for the um, presentation. I just wondering, where does growth come from in your model or in your idea? Because you mentioned that aggregate demand leads more growth. But it could be seen as approaching the potential of the economy. So how does the potential, that potential output of the economy develop? Is it through the investment effect or is it some other effects? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Any ideas, suggestions, recommendations? Yes. Good evening. I think this links back to the question we had a little bit earlier, but financialization to some extent is referring to what I look at as short-termism, so sort of the quick gain or the quick win versus a long-term strategy. And if you're looking at policy, you're looking at 20 years. If you're looking at, you know, sort of gender equality and wages, we still haven't got there. They were saying it should take about 207 years before um, you get gender equality in wages. So you're looking at very, very long lead times. So how do you look at, apart from incentivizing through taxes and dividends, but really addressing the issue of a long-term approach versus the short-termism where it's not just a national government that comes in and has five years in place to put something into place and try and do something, or a corporate CEO comes in and he quickly wants the share price to go up and, and gain from shareholder value. So how do you deal with, with those two issues? And then just one other question on the green investment. You said you're busy looking at case studies and doing research on that at the moment. I don't know if you've looked at South Africa as a case study, but there's been quite a focus within South Africa on what's called the green economy as an area of investment, and I'm not sure whether that is actually leading to this growth-led economy, as, as you've alluded to, that green investment should lead to growth. I don't think that's quite happening there, but I don't know if you've looked at it, and I'd be interested in your views on it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any additional, any more questions? Can I ask? You may, yes. I think the point I was trying to make, possibly too clumsily and quickly, is a sort of grander historical one, which is, I think you've said, certainly in, the, in your response to the questions, that wage increases, and presumably also increased state expenditure, in any individual country would be sufficient to lead to better results, not only in that country, but for the global economy more generally. Uh, it would be even better if it was coordinated uh, expansion across a number of economies. But the question is, well, why doesn't it happen then? Um, and so, and I suppose I was trying to tease out an answer to do with the, the way in which national economies have been fractured and their, uh, the pursuit of interests are much more along international lines. And we can see that in the case of what's happened to, um, to Greece. So it's, it's, but that, that was really what I was trying to, to push at. To what extent can the division of uh, economies into profit-led or wage-led do sufficient justice to the nature of the world today as compared to, say, well, how it was in the post-war boom, which might be seen as corresponding to what you're trying to restore? Okay, any more? Final round. Good. Awesome. Right, that would have been enough. Thank you very much. Oh, this is very thought provoking. Um, shall I start with Ben? No, Ben, uh, let me leave you to the end because this is, of course, the very substantial uh, question you're uh, uh, asking. Let's start with uh, Alfredo's point about uh, Venezuela in particular. Um, I think uh, th th this is why. I really am uh, moving towards thinking of a policy mix. Oh, now, the good news about uh, progressive or egalitarian labor market policies, decreasing inequality, increasing wages, is that uh, I have a very good case to make against a neoliberal economist. It does not hamper growth. And it does not even hamper potential growth. I'll come up to a point about potential growth. If anything, the impact is positive. Uh, but this is not the silver magic bullet that will sort out all your problems. Uh, so for at the end of the day, uh, you need uh, to uh, diversify your economy. You need to uh, invest in social and physical infrastructure. You need to be able to produce uh, a variety of uh, different types of goods if you want to achieve full employment with decent incomes uh, and you know increase well-being at the end of the day because that's what we are aiming at. If you don't do that, um, you can live up uh, all revenues uh, when all prices are doing well, uh, but that will uh, come to an end. Um, and it's also about, I think, stabilizing these policies uh, against political capture, uh, and that may reverse such trends. Um, so in, inside the Brazilian case, some of the policies about rising minimum wages were very good, but if it doesn't come with institutionalizing, I think, collective voice and giving more space to uh, social movements, um, things can be reversed very easily. Uh, there is also the uh, uh, politics of that. Uh, but again, um, I mean, in terms of the Brazilian experience, we can praise the labor market policies, uh, at least with respect to minimum wages. But uh, Latin American economists are also complaining a lot about the lack of uh, significant developmentalist public spending, um, so public investment to, to lead the way. So again, I think we really have to think about uh, a mix of policies. Uh, we need to think about reversing financialization. I mean, Brazil is a very financialized uh, economy. And of course, uh, private investment, as well as public investment, has been uh, not flourishing as much as uh, it could in the presence of such a high financialized uh, uh, regime. So basically, we need to think about all the dimensions. Redistribution is as important as uh, transfers, um, basically trying to make sure that the, uh, the top of the distribution belt concentration is 
increasingly more under check, so things like progressive income taxation, but also taxation of belt. Again, these are the things to institutionalize um, more collective voice uh, and to avoid political capture. So uh, it, it, it's not uh, issues that you can sort out by sorting out one or two good policies. And sadly, um, even now in South Korea, the, the two things they're thinking about is minimum wages, and more social transfers and better social infrastructure, a bit like uh, the Brazilian 2003 uh, policies. Uh, broader policies at the moment still uh, is sounding too daring to them, but if you don't do the policy mix full, I think it will uh, not have the uh, impact. I mean, capital controls. Now, one thing that always worries me about the Labour Party's policy stance, particularly in terms of their vision of Brexit, is they like talking about managing labour mobility a lot, but they praise trade uh, and uh, capital mobility, or they say nothing about capital mobility. Uh, for me, the single market at least was um, a check in terms of giving more uh, balance between labor's mobility and capital mobility. And if you want to implement capital controls, these kind of things are better implemented at a larger uh, economic and financial area than at a smaller one like the UK. You may be forgiven that the okay, UK is the uh, financial center of the world, but of course if you want to implement capital controls, you would want to lobby at the European Union level to do it at the European Union level. European Union was actually, uh, well, the UK has been a barrier to implement even a, a modest financial transactions tactics. Europeans are sometimes thinking we will be better off without the UK. So uh, where does that leave us? So uh, I suppose policy advice to the Labour Party uh, would be continue to work together with Europe for um, more control on the area of maneuver of financial capital at the expense of the city. Some jobs in the city may be lost, but the city has not been the locomotive of neither credit generation for sustainable investment in this country, nor uh, in terms of uh, uh, generating jobs. I mean, in absolute numbers, of course, it's a big employer, but um, uh, the gap that they will leave uh, would, could be easily filled with a massive uh, public investment program, in my opinion, and uh, a large national investment bank to create the necessary finance for all kinds of businesses, including cooperatives, small businesses, but also hopefully large publicly owned enterprises in the much needed uh, areas, which requires massive large scale investment, massive large scale finance. So I would think there is more space for capital controls, even in Britain, if you, again, mix it with public investment and a national investment bank uh, policy, giving more support to uh, cooperatives, uh, local banks, uh, savings unions, um, and uh, they will make, hopefully, the city redundant. And by the way, I think businesses aren't stupid. Obviously, um, individually, nobody would want to see corporate tax rates going up, and they will resist it as much as they can, but uh, when policies are implemented uh, that will create more demand in an economy, businesses also will notice that there is an interesting thing going on there. So the threat of capital uh, outflow is always going to be more hyperbolic than actual capital mobility. I mean, that we have seen also uh, everywhere in the world. Whenever uh, there is a uh, trade union negotiation in Eastern Europe or in the US, uh, no matter where, um, employers start making hyperbolic claims that they're going to relocate. Uh, more often than not, the threat is enough to prevent the unionization in that workplace. So uh, mobility actually doesn't happen, but the threat is there. Uh, and I'm not saying that uh, mobility is small. Mobility is huge. Capital controls are therefore important. Um, um, and I believe uh, it, it is possible to impose that on capital. Now, um, that would tie very neatly to Ben's last remark. Why is that not happening? But before I go there, let me um, go back to your point about where is growth coming from. I have talked today mostly about the demand side of growth, meaning uh, demand generates more growth, and 
The long and the short of it is uh, the long run is the success, succession of the short run, and in both the short run and the long run, demand is important. So demand is important for uh, investment, hence also for uh, productivity and for potential growth. Uh, in a newer uh, paper, which is not online yet, and it won't be until summer, I'm afraid, we are trying to have both the supply and de demand side of growth model. So uh, in the long run, uh, demand will have an effect on productivity, a positive one, and it does empirically it's well uh, established. Wages also have an impact on productivity because uh, low wages actually does discourage investment and uh, leads to lower productivity, whereas high wages uh, does make businesses rethink and uh, invest and increases productivity. Obviously then the impact of growth on employment in the long run is moderated a little bit with this rise in productivity. You can build all that um, in. So the supply side, what, what the mainstream economists tell us to be the supply side, which is all about technology and productivity, isn't something uh, exogenous. It is actually affected by demand, it is affected by uh, wages, and maybe uh, tying to the other comment about the uh, long-term impact, in the long run, it's very much affected by also public investment. And to my surprise, in Britain, productivity is particularly uh, affected by public investment in uh, health, uh, education and care. The impact of that doesn't come overnight, just as you were saying, particularly if you're thinking of education and child care, the mechanism, the impact of that on productivity, okay, there is an overnight effect, meaning if you release the productive uh, capacity of uh, women who are otherwise working part-time, who are maybe not working because they have to, they're the ones to take care of the children, when you provide universal uh, affordable uh, child care, those women would come to the market and it automatically, of course, overnight increases productivity. But in the long run, uh, we know that uh, early preschool education uh, and nursery is one of the most important elements of development of cognitive capacity of human beings. So uh, if you put those children into the nursery, you will get in 20 years very productive adults uh, and also probably more social adults, but that's a different matter. From a sheer mechanical productivity perspective, Childcare is a very key policy for productivity and in the UK the numbers are showing that very clearly. It's not about building roads, it's about building, or well, okay, having nurseries and probably having well-educated, well-trained nursery teachers would make things even better, which we don't have at the moment because those people are getting uh, sort of the minimum wage, a uh, poverty wage. Now, uh, but this is going to happen in 20 years. So capital, everybody wants skill investment, but their understanding of skills is some vocational training, not nursery. They don't want to pay a penny more tax to spend on universal free childcare, right? They would say, oh, this is large state, we don't want that. Uh, who is going to do that? Well, the only actor in the society that can think for the next 20 years is the state. Um, so the state has to play this role of the Bonaparte and maybe, um, well, your other point about green investment in South Africa, I only know one piece of research on uh, the impact of uh, green investment on uh, employment in a variety of uh, economies including South Africa, but Indonesia, South Korea as well as developed economies by Bob Pollin and uh, colleagues, uh, a piece they did for UNIDO, is showing actually very positive employment multiplier effects from investment in um, renewable, uh, renewable energy, but also uh, biofuel, but also other green spending such as retrofitting. Uh, and they are saying it's very uh, labor intensive. So the in, the, the the effect of uh, one billion dollars um, spent in green infrastructure is a lot stronger than spending it in fossil fuel or traditional uh, mining uh, enterprises. So I see a positive thing to come from the, at least the employment effect uh, of that. And they were making the case that it's also more egalitarian in terms of its impact on lower educated workers versus higher uh, educated workers, men versus women. Uh, but it's a big book 
looking at multiple countries, including South Africa. Now, all these things sound great, and why is it not happening? I think globalization and financial globalization is only uh, two of the guys to blame. Um, at the nation level, and, you know, um, uh, we have learned from Keynes, but we have also learned from Marx. And one of the most interesting economists that I, uh, you know, have read in my life, uh, Michal Kalecki, a uh, Polish economist, is exactly somebody who has learned from both Keynes and Marx. And in one of my favorite articles, uh, The Political Economy of, of Employment, he writes, uh, he actually thinks that the whole, uh, all economies are wage-led. Um, well, I don't think so. We are post kalitskians so an economy can be profit-led as well. But empirically, I think the UK, uh, Europe, uh, you know, some large developing uh, emerging economies, Turkey, South Korea, seems to be wage late to me. So, moving on from what Kalitsky writes, he says, well, higher wages will actually increase growth and it will also serve the interests of businesses because it will create m higher income, higher profit income for them as well as the pie is uh, increasing. Their share may fall, but total profits will increase, he writes. Uh, why is that not happening? Well, he says businesses would not want to give away the threat of the sack. So higher wages, higher growth and full employment is something that may be conducive to even higher profits, but they would want to have the power of sacking workers. Otherwise, they would be too scared of the political power of the working people. Um, so I understand this is, this is a national problem and Kalitsky doesn't even think of globalization. He's writing that in 1948, obviously. Uh, so the political change can only come from uh, one social actor here, in my opinion. That's the labor movement because obviously, although um, clever businesses are worried, like the Hermes Investment Fund Manager Conference attendees, that higher inequality is destabilizing, they are still so much trapped in their uh, class interests. Um, uh, so the state can play the Bonaparte, but the state is captured, uh, obviously. Uh, I mean, uh, the wealthy buys election campaigns and the lobbies. Um, to turn the tide around, you need very strong uh, labor organizations and social organizations, social movements. And I believe this is happening. Um, this is not happening homogeneously, uh, but um, it's, it certainly is the only source uh, that can put any of these policies on table and get them implemented. Um, and I see how difficult, therefore, it is. Um, I suppose we would agree with that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, uh, very much for coming. And everyone is invited to the reception upstairs in the staff common room. Plenty of food and drink for everybody. And you can relax and you can ask them all the difficult questions that you've been keeping uh, back. <laughs> you didn't want to ask me in, in the public, uh, so it's actually me an easy time. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs>